It's the end of the year 2020, so it's about that time for a top games list. Although it's been a crazy year to say the least, for more reasons than I can count on both hands, it's been an outstanding year for video games. Tons of great AAA releases, tons of great smaller releases, quality video games have been coming out all year long. So today, I'm going to tell you what my top 15 games of this year were. 10 is too little. Before I get started, let's set some ground rules. Obviously, this is my list, so it'll likely be different than your list. The usually some angry comments will pop up because your game wasn't on my list. It'll be okay, I promise. Also, I make it a rule that my list never contains standalone DLC or expansions, HD re-releases of games that came out years ago unless they're, you know, from the ground up remakes. Just full new 2020 releases. And games I haven't personally played aren't in here either. Or any December releases, they just didn't make it in time before this video. I'd also like to introduce my Patreon if you'd like to help support the channel more directly. There's multiple levels of support available, or for an option right here on YouTube, you can also become a channel member and get access to exclusive badges and emojis for use on live streams. Every dollar helps the wheels keep turning behind the scenes, and I'd like to thank my current channel members and patrons for their continued support. Number 15. Maneater. Maneater is a game that does not feel next-gen at all. Although it does have a Series X and PS5 version, it feels like something that came out of the PlayStation 2 era. And I mean that completely as a compliment. It's a much simpler game compared to the enormous AAA sandbox games that we're all so familiar with in this modern age of gaming. It doesn't have any groundbreaking graphics, cinematic level storytelling, but it's just pure entertainment. You're a shark, and you eat things. That's the game. But it's so much fun and it keeps you playing. One aspect the game nails is the humor. The entire story, since a shark can't speak obviously, is narrated as if the player were watching a nature documentary about sharks. The bull performs an acrobatic feat worthy of an orca, cruelly imprisoned and put on display in a marine park stunt. While it is well known that sharks feed on mollusks, fish, and seals, less discussed is their propensity to feed on fear. Although most of the mission objectives in the game basically amount to eating a certain number of other animals or other humans, it never really gets boring. You're regularly upgrading your shark's body as it grows from being a baby shark into an adult and an elder with over-the-top evolutions like bioelectric teeth that you get fairly early on that shock enemies when you bite them. And it gets even more ridiculous as the game goes on as you age into a bigger, stronger shark and newer areas become accessible and boss battles open up with apex predators in the area. The entire goal of this game is to become the most ultimate fearsome predator in the seas. And similar to GTA, the more trouble you cause, the more human bounty hunters come after you. This game is a reminder that smaller gaming experiences can still be a blast to play through and it's worth checking out. Despite Port Clovis's best efforts, the aquatic beast refuses to be tamed. Number 14, Astro's Playroom. This was a game I had zero expectation of having on my top games list, and it actually booted out another game I was going to put on here instead. Just recently, I randomly decided to check it out after it was sitting in my PlayStation 5 for about two weeks untouched. It's a free pack-in game included on every PS5 hard drive, so I was sure it was going to be just some sort of tech demo, and it essentially is, but at the same time, it packs in enough content to be a standalone game. Would started as a, I'll check this out for a couple minutes, turned into three hours later, and I still couldn't put it down. This is the game that really makes you appreciate the technology inside the PS5, and it showcases how all of its features can be used. And it comes in the form of a 3D platformer. As Astro, you play as a little robot that lives inside the PS5, and all the different worlds you travel to are based off different aspects of the PlayStation architecture, like SSD Speedway or GPU Jungle, ray tracing ruins, every Everything has a really cool name. You're exploring the inside of your console. The entire game is a celebration of the PlayStation brand, even down to its collectibles going through the brand's history. There's little plants that are made out of the shapes on the face buttons, there's murals you can form. This game has so much to do, so much personality, and there was a surprising amount of care put into an experience that's free. 
Number 13, Battletoads. The return of the Battletoads was one of my most anticipated releases this year. I've been waiting literally since I was a kid for them to make their big comeback, and they're back. And although I can't say it was perfect or groundbreaking, I was mostly satisfied with the new game. Battletoads is a series that's seen by many as a beat-em-up but outside of the amazing arcade game, it's more of a mishmash of different genres with some beat-em-up segments at its core, rather than a straight-up beat-em-up itself. Battletoads 2020 repeats that same formula and mostly succeeds, although some of the little mini-game segments I could have done without and some do overstay their welcome a bit too long, but it feels great having a modern yet retro-style functional beat-em-up. It also has some space shooter bullet hell segments that are extremely challenging on the higher difficulty settings and, of course, the classic turbo tunnels make a return. This game is Battletoads through and through, from its strength even down to its shortcomings. The most unexpected pleasure from playing this game, though, was the surprisingly outstanding cutscenes. The humor was so on point, and it demands an animated series with this style of animation and comedy. Number 12, Legend of Zelda Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. I've made it no secret that I think Breath of the Wild was incredibly overrated for a variety of reasons, but I did enjoy its overall universe and backstory. As a from the original release Zelda fan, there's a lot of things I would have done differently in Breath of the Wild, but Age of Calamity is a slice of the Breath of the Wild story with the more simple hack and slash Dynasty Warrior style gameplay. There's not much more to this game than simply running around mashing buttons while while battling large groups of enemies and bosses, but honestly, that's all this game really needs to be. It's full of action, it has a great soundtrack, and there's a large amount of different playable characters plucked from the world of Breath of the Wild. It details the story that's touched on in Breath of the Wild, with Ganon making his return and the kingdom falling into ruin, and then Link waking up years later. This is the before. So it's interesting seeing that aspect of the storyline play out, and it's great seeing Nintendo properties being handled by outside companies, different than the traditional gameplay style of the series. This is something I would definitely like to see more of in the future. Number 11. Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. Well, it's about time this series got a proper sequel. Since the PS1 days, Crash Bandicoot always felt like those unique, timeless PlayStation franchises. Though, to be fair, it hasn't been an exclusively PlayStation brand in ages, but every time I think of Crash, I think of PlayStation. Through the years, it's had sequels and weird spin-off games, but Crash 4 comes back to its roots, mainly following the first three games, and bringing the gameplay back to the basics. If you've played a Crash game before, you'll be right home with this one. You jump, you spin, you break crates, fight bosses, and collect things. It's what a modern Crash game should be. The same classic gameplay with some added gameplay elements with different powers, a plethora of different characters you could choose from, multiple unlockable skins, and it's welcoming to all players. For those that want that easier experience, it offers a modern mode, complete with checkpoints and unlimited retries. But for the hardcore, there is the retro mode, which is great for players that like the challenge of limited lives and game overs. And it is no breeze. The humor, the presentation, the gameplay and art style all combine to create that magical experience that feels like you're playing the original PlayStation for the first time all over again. Number 10, Star Wars Squadrons. Now, I do want to specify that my opinion on this game may have been different had I played a different version of the game, so I want to make it clear that my experience has been exclusively with the PlayStation 4 VR version of Squadrons. One of my biggest criticisms of VR console games has been the lack of full games taking advantage of VR. Usually we get these cheap little tech demos that are an hour or two long. Squadrons is that full Star Wars fighter pilot experience I've been waiting to play for years. From inside the cockpit of your Starfighter, in VR, it's amazing just glancing around while wearing the VR headset and moving your head from side to side quickly as you circle around an enemy ship in a dogfight. It feels like you're genuinely inside a cockpit flying. I could imagine some people would get motion sickness, so if you are prone to that, this may not be the best version for you. There is a lot of movement, but VR is just a feature. The actual game is what really matters here and how it plays, and this is no Rogue Squadron. Although I do have some criticisms about the story being extremely predictable, and I feel like I've seen it play out a thousand times before in multiple other Star Wars properties, and none of the Rebel pilots are really interesting to me. The story does have the strength of being told from both sides, though, and I love going through the Imperial campaign playing as the bad guys from the cockpit of a TIE fighter. Squadron's true strength, though, is the gameplay. As I said before, it's no Rogue Squadron where you just kind of fly around, there's a standard attack button, and missiles. Squadrons has much more strategy involved to the combat that requires you to forward your Starfighter's power to different aspects 
aspects of your starfighter during combat, like your engines, your shields, or your lasers, switching back and forth between all of them in order to survive and overcome. Instead of just being a pilot flying a ship, it makes you feel like you're managing all its onboard systems. I was concerned originally this would be a copy and paste of the ship battles from Battlefront, but it's not. It's more of a semi-realistic flight and combat simulator if Star Wars vehicles were realistic. There's a multiplayer mode too, which to be honest, I never checked it out, but the campaign has been extremely fun, and I really enjoyed the immersion it provides. If you have access to VR, I definitely recommend that as the definitive way to play squadrons, assuming you're not prone to motion sickness. Number 9, Predator Hunting Grounds. Let me start off by saying that hunting grounds can be a glitchy mess. Sometimes when I restart it, all my loadouts are vanished, I have to reset all my equipment again, sometimes the online just doesn't feel like working, but I absolutely love this game. When hunting grounds works perfectly, it's one of the most fun experiences I've ever had playing on my streams with the community. Working together with other players to complete mission objectives, while a predator stalks and hunts them, and all the players frantically claim they saw it somewhere in the trees, and until it shows up to wipe everyone out, when you take down a predator failing to stop his wrist bomb from going off, listening to everyone screaming to run and get away from the blast followed by laughter, it's very similar to Friday the 13th where one player is the killer and everyone else is the victim, except this time the victims have machine guns. Aside from the actual gameplay, Hunting Grounds is filled with goodies that Predator fans will eat up. The addition of Dutch and an entire storyline through recorded audio cassettes explaining Dutch's entire journey through the year 2025 which I made an entire video on, here's a link to that in the corner for you. New Predator outfits, both original and from the movies. This is the Predator gift that keeps on giving over time. And if you are a fan of the Predator, it's a must-have. Well, this is the fall match anyhow, so... Ah! <laughs> I'm taking you all with me! You're not gonna have time to escape! You're not gonna have time to escape! I can get up on my own. You don't have time. We're all going out. We're all going out together. No. <laughs> Did I take anyone with me? Oh, I got splash damage as a trophy. Number 8, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon 2. It's rare when I enjoy a game so much that I actively go through and 100% all the trophies the first weekend I get it. That's Curse of the Moon 2. It came out of nowhere when the trailer dropped, it released not that long after, and it was cheaply priced, but it gave me the experience of a full-fledged retro-style game. Had this released back in the late 80s, early 90s, it would be considered a classic to this day. Just like the first Curse of the Moon, sure, it's a rip-off of classic Castlevania games like Dracula's Curse. It's well aware of that, but it paints a personality of its own and adds its own unique mechanics. Aside from being a fun, challenging Castlevania-style side-scroller, what makes Curse of the Moon 2 truly special is the sheer amount of replayability. To get the true ending, you need to go through the experience several times, and each playthrough makes enough changes to make it feel totally different, taking some characters away from you, replacing certain characters, adding stages and bosses, and it all amounts to an awesome final section that the story all culminates into. It forces you not to get comfortable with one specific character. Certain characters are better for certain situations, and you really need to flip between all of them in order to succeed and develop different strategies through each playthrough. In other words, don't get used to the almost invincible Hachi. I did and I had a rough time undoing that, and it was my own fault. Amazing retro style soundtrack, amazing boss battles, this is one beautiful retro package. Number 7, Spider-Man Miles Morales. To sum up this game, if you enjoyed Insomniac's original Spider-Man PS4 game, you'll enjoy this one. At its core, it's more of the same, same style gameplay. You swing around, you do side quests and main missions with the occasional boss battle, but with the added flair that it's Miles Morales, not Peter Parker. So this Spider-Man has some special powers that the original Spider-Man doesn't have that adds another layer to the combat that we didn't have before. It is significantly a bit shorter than the main game was, but then again, it's not a full price release and was always advertised as being more of a side game in the style of Uncharted Lost Legacy. Story-wise, it does continue the story, with Peter Parker leaving the country with Mary Jane for a bit, and leaves Miles in charge. This is one to try out on the PS5, graphically with its ray tracing and visual improvements, or silky smooth frame rate, depending on what graphics option you choose, it looks and feels next-gen. And to add on, it's incredibly cinematic, it's full of heart, with a story that matches. And as a gamer of Puerto Rican descent myself, I have to say that seeing all the references to my own culture and upbringing was something very personal to me, and it was actually really heartwarming to say the least. Number 6. 
Final Fantasy VII Remake. Final Fantasy VII Remake was a complete surprise for me. I knew I was going to enjoy it, but I didn't expect how much I was going to love it. I'll try to keep this next section mostly spoiler free, but I thought I was just going to play the original game all over again with prettier graphics, hence the name Remake. It's not actually what we have here. Although Remake is in the title and we do revisit elements of the Final Fantasy VII story, by the end of the game, it's made clear that this isn't simply Final Fantasy VII. It's something more that's paving the way forward for a completely different story. To me, this is how a good remake is done. You take elements from the original and craft a new experience, and if we're speaking strictly on graphics, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I don't feel the original graphics of Final Fantasy VII, while they look great for their time, they have not aged well. Not as well as nostalgia would have you believe. And Remake recreates the world of Final Fantasy VII, or at least a slice of what's to come in amazing detail. Gameplay-wise, I was never a big fan of the whole turn-based combat mechanics of JRPGs, although I could still find it enjoyable in certain games, like the Final Fantasy series. Remake instead has a much faster-paced combat system that has you simultaneously managing multiple members of your party and attacking from different angles. It's a huge improvement, and it really breathes new life into the series. Aside from the combat, there's so much side stuff you can do, especially when you get into the seedy area of town and you get a hand massage that's very obviously sexual in nature and hilarious, and the scene where Cloud gets dressed up as a girl, genuinely entertaining moments that you couldn't really represent like this in the original with the console limitations of the time. I know it's a long shot, but I hope Square someday takes this formula and remakes Final Fantasy VIII in the same manner also, but for now, having Final Fantasy VII Remake is just fine. Number 5. Resident Evil 3 Resident Evil 3 is in a unique position in the fan base. It seems Resident Evil fans either hated it or loved it. There doesn't really seem to be an in-between there. Much of the criticism, which I do understand, to an extent, amounts to sections being removed or replaced from the original Resident Evil 3 in this new reimagining. But for me, I love that it was such a vastly different experience compared to the original. I personally don't see the point of making the same game over again with the shiny coat of paint. Although I still would have enjoyed it, if you're going to make a modern version of a game that came out during the PS1, era, go ahead and change it up for a fresh modern experience, and that's what Resident Evil 3 does, creating a faster paced, more cinematic video game, compared to the slower paced horror oriented world of Resident Evil 2. But this is another one of those games that I wanted to complete 100% soon after buying it. I put about 40 hours in getting all the achievements and going through multiple playthroughs that were becoming progressively more difficult, but the game rewards you and it eggs you on constantly with more rewards that you can purchase by completing different tasks, like killing a certain amount of enemies with a certain weapon weapon type, it's the challenge and replayability that absolutely sold me on this game. After I beat it, I wanted to go back and get faster time and see how quickly I could go through it. It felt like the old days, where I used to try and speedrun my old Resident Evil playthroughs simply because I wanted to. And the main attraction of the show Nemesis is a beast, turning into more monstrous transformations than ever, and even on the higher difficulties with an unlimited rocket launcher in your possession, he could dodge it quickly. Unlike the original game where if you actually remember, you could simply run past him multiple times. In this version, we've got some epic forced boss battles with Nemesis. If you play through this game one time, call it short and put it away, you're doing it all wrong. Number 4, Streets of Rage 4. This is the epic return of the Streets of Rage series that we haven't seen since the third installment in the 90s. Like Battletoads, a classic series was brought into the present day, and while Battletoads had some hit or misses, Streets of Rage 4 was a slam dunk. To say that the talented developers over at .emu did a good job is an understatement. Streets of Rage 4 kicks ass in every definition of the word. I cannot praise it enough. It's a love letter to the series, but it doesn't completely depend on nostalgia to prove itself with a worthy sequel. It creates its own personality, even down to the animation and the overall look and feel. The gameplay is crafted towards whatever playstyle you prefer, with each character having a different feel, with their combat from the slower, more powerful tank character, to the weaker but much faster fighter, to somewhere in between. Not to mention the bonus of having the classic three characters back, Adam Hunter back to his former glory, among some newcomers. And the soundtrack is so good, I had no choice but to purchase the limited run vinyl. It's got that 80s slash 90s retro synthwave feel, and the music ramps up at just the right time when you're surrounded by enemies, it gets you ready to whoop some ass. The game's high energy, and of course plenty of replayability with higher difficulty levels. Playing through with each character, mandatory end stage boss battles, it's all here. It's improved, nostalgic, yet modern at the same time. 
Number three, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Disclaimer, I haven't actually finished the game yet. Being as I've put about 45 hours into the campaign, with the end still nowhere near in sight, I can confidently say this is one of my favorite games of the year, and I'll keep my comments spoiler free. Valhalla is essentially an Assassin's Creed experiment, coming to a sort of conclusion and finding its stride. What do I mean by that? While the series was once criticized for being too similar game after game, then Origins came in and changed the formula and genre almost completely, and those same gamers complained that now it was too different, filled with RPG elements. Valhalla is the balance that brings everything back together again. Odyssey took the changes of Origins and expanded it even further to ridiculously huge levels. Valhalla takes what they've learned since then, scales it back a bit, and reintroduces some classic assassination mechanics and stealth mechanics. A happy medium, if you will. This time, the Viking warrior Eivor is immediately one of the most interesting main characters we've had. A young Viking warrior that suffered through tragedy sails to a new land to build a better life for his or her people. Depending on which one you chose, I'll refer to him as him because I want the epic beard. And throughout his journey, he becomes embroiled in the conflict between ancient enemies familiar to fans and a certain brotherhood of hidden ones. There's so many improvements to the series in Valhalla that I can likely make an entire video on just that subject alone. Gone on are the massive amount of side quests in Odyssey that amount to fetch quest and giving random characters money. The side quests now are known as world events and each have a unique story and situation tied to it. The combat lets you play how you want, equipping whatever weapon you'd like in one hand and a different one in the other. If you want double shields, if you want one hammer, one knife, one sword, whatever you want. And the beauty of the worlds of Norway and England, sometimes you just have to stop and just soak it all in when you're synchronizing a viewpoint. This game is so damn good and if you fell off the Assassin's Creed bandwagon a couple of games ago, consider jumping back in with Valhalla. I don't think you'll regret it. Number two, Ghost of Tsushima. This is more than a video game. It's an experience. Sure, if you look at strictly just the game design, it's just a standard open world game, just like many we've seen throughout the years. There's a slew of collectibles around the map. You open up more areas to explore as the story progresses. Side quests aplenty. And it does have some valid criticisms, like having sort of a wonky camera when you're surrounded by multiple enemies. Near the end of the game, when you have all your upgrades, the game becomes a little bit too easy. But things like this are just nitpicks picks in the greater scheme of things. The beauty of this game comes down to Sucker Punch creating a world that feels alive. A Japanese island under siege by a seemingly barbaric enemy, it truly paints this picture of despair that makes you feel like you are the only hope for these people. You see how the Mongols are making the people of the island suffer. It's rare when you do a side quest that has a happy ending. A lot of times these side quests that you go through essentially just confirm how bad things are. The game does an amazing job at making you feel what the characters in the game are feeling. There's plenty of moments in the story that trigger genuine emotions. And Sucker Punch has crafted a story here about family, honor, doing what's necessary to protect the ones you love versus sticking to traditions. There are so many different things wrapped in this story. And it's all brought to life with some of the best acting I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing in a video game. You get emotionally invested in all of these characters and all the situations they're involved in. Even the horse. There is no excuse for not owning this game. Every single PS4 owner should have this in their collection. And if I can have two number one spots, Ghost of Tsushima would be there right next to number one, Doom Eternal. All right, I really wrestled with Doom Eternal or Ghost of Tsushima for the number one spot. And after much debate, I'm comfortable with saying Doom Eternal is my number one game of 2020. And I'll explain why. It's almost the complete opposite of Ghost of Tsushima, but equally engrossing for other reasons. Where Tsushima is an emotional roller coaster with a fantastic story, Doom is all about adrenaline, fast-paced action, and absolute carnage. It is unapologetically loud and brutal and it rarely slows down. I'll go out on a limb and say it's not for everybody, though. I've always loved difficult games, 
and even on the easier settings, Doom Eternal is not an easy game. It's just a little less hard. In fact, in its higher difficulties like Nightmare Mode, it is a true test of patience, perseverance, and you do have to have a little bit of crazy inside of you to try and master it. It takes everything about Doom 2016, it adds on to it, it speeds it all up to the point where when I did play Doom 2016 afterwards, it felt like I was playing in slow motion. Doom Eternal, in a way, kind of reminds me of Sekiro, where the game is constantly training you for what's coming next. And just to contrast it with Tsushima, where I mentioned earlier that by the end it's a little too easy, Doom Eternal is the opposite once again. Early on, some enemies seem insurmountable, and you need to learn what weapons work better against which ones. As you progress in the game, those once insurmountable enemies start coming at you in higher numbers as regular enemies, combined with the small fry enemies. Bosses are constantly becoming standard monsters that you fight over and over, and the game keeps ramping up the demons the further you get in. It refuses to become easier. This game is the destroyer of wills. This is why I say it's not for everybody. That doesn't sound like a good time for many gamers, but for me it's refreshing because we live in an age where when a hard video game comes out that is genuinely difficult, people start yelling for it to be toned down, and Doom stands its ground proudly as truly being hardcore. I can't express the feeling of pure relief and satisfaction you get from fighting a massive amount of enemies over and over until you succeed standing alone as the blood-soaked victor, and it's almost magical in a way with how strategic the game is at its core. This is not just a basic first-person shooter, it's a beautiful dance of chaos and order, as you have to quickly switch through different weapons and strategies because the game has taught you which ones work better against which enemies, and they're all coming at you at once. Eventually, you get into this flow of combat, and it's also full of impressive boss battles with enormous monsters, some being a callback to old-school Doom, like the icon of sin. Apart from the gameplay, although the game doesn't focus on story, it does have a surprising amount of lore that gives us explanations on where exactly these demons are coming from and how it's affecting everything in the Doom universe. Doom Eternal is a game that, for the life of me, I sat here and tried to think of one thing I didn't like, and I could not find a single fault with it. Besides a small glitch here and there, but that doesn't really affect the gameplay much, it's my perfect game, and I have no idea how any potential sequel could top it. And that's my top 15 games of 2020. Leave me some comments down below with some of your favorite, whether they're on my list or not. And let me know your thoughts on some of the titles I did choose. I'll catch you guys later. Since you made it to the end of this video, I assume you enjoyed it, so why don't you go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any new content. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, links in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can join my Patreon or become a channel member. This is Fabian, I love you guys, and I'll see you next time.